Oh no! I'm going into the Upside Down! The only thing that could save me is if you guys subscribe to The Stand Show on YouTube and turn on notifications! And watch every Tuesday and Friday on Twitch.television at 1pm PST! Oh no! Oh, you did it! Welcome to episode 17 of The Stand Show. Let's get into it, because we're here to talk the latest and greatest esports news. We're here to give you the ammunition you need to be the smartest guy in your Discord group. To tell people, well, actually, this is what's happening. To get to the bottom, to the down and dirty, to the nitty gritty, to the little tiny intricacies that only a Sherlock Holmesian esports and gaming mind would know. Some of the things that I have found through hours and hours of investigative journalism. Let's talk about story number one. In fact, let's actually, let's leave a little bit of a secret because the king is coming and you don't know who the king is. Now you might think the king is Amazon. You might think the king is Apple. You might think the king is Epic, who are in a lawsuit with Apple, which is something that I have been very interested in talking about on the podcast. And as I was doing some research into it, I realized that courtrooms and lawsuits are boring as fuck. There's a reason why I got a political science degree and didn't go to law school, because no one gives a shit. I cannot imagine something more dry than Epic versus Apple. The thought that they are going head to head over the cut that Apple is taking from every download on the App Store for every single item. Now I get it, Epic. I think you are in the right. Apple shouldn't be beholden to 30% of every single single transaction that happens on the phone just because a kid wants to buy the new beast boy skin or or pele or something doesn't mean that apple should get 30 percent of that maybe only something up front or at least a better cut than 30 percent you're the biggest game on the app store hell you're the biggest game in the world one of the biggest games of all time i think you deserve it and the fact that you went and got your friends spotify and tinder together so that you can try and leverage a better deal is really cool it's it's capitalism it's the invisible hand of the market or something I don't know. I got a political science degree, not a business degree. I don't know shit. But as I was looking through it, I realized that, that is the only exciting part. But I kept reading because it's my job to get down and dirty for you guys. I read and I read and I read. Chapter after chapter, page after page, tweet after tweet, just trying to get to the bottom of exactly what's going on here. And I stumbled across something. I stumbled across something that will shake you to your core. And if it doesn't shake you to your core, it's definitely going to shake Atrioc to his core. Because there's a new king in the room. There is a company out there who is trying to get into this space that maybe you don't expect. When you think of cloud gaming, who do you think of? Uh, I think of NVIDIA. My best friend, Brandon Atriok Ewing, works there. He talks about NVIDIA's cloud gaming all the time, how they're the only one that can do it. Maybe you think about Google. They've kind of fucked up Stadia a little bit, but you know what? They'll get there. They'll try their best. Yeah, they pulled all their funding for their games, but you know what? It's Google. They're not going to fuck that up. But the truth is, there's a dark horse in this race. There is a company so bold and brash that has been working in the shadows for the past few years to make sure that they are the number one victory royaler in the cloud gaming space. It's not Nintendo. It's Walmart leaked in all of these files in the Apple versus Epic lawsuit. There have been emails that came out and says that over the last three years, Walmart has been working on switch style controllers to plug into your phone and a subscription service so that you can subscribe to Walmart gaming and play video games on your phone. No one's heard of it. They're literally the dark horse. They're coming out of nowhere. And Walmart is one of the biggest companies in the world. I remember when I was a kid going to Walmart, Target, Toys R Us, and while we were shopping, I would beg, I would plead, I would get down on my knees and I would say, mom, can I please go to the video game section because they have a demo console set up and I can go play Super Smash Bros for the Nintendo 64. Please, please let me play Super Smash Bros for the Nintendo 64. And sometimes if I was a good boy that week, she would let me. Now, when I first heard this, I thought there's no way that Walmart will succeed where these other ones have failed. But then I remembered that story and I thought, what if 
you could go to the demo station, play it on a phone, and get a coupon and or some kind of business card that said, play this game on your phone, which every kid has now, give this to your mom, and she can buy it at the register now. In fact, maybe just slide it in there. It's just a coupon. No one will see it, right? Just go ahead and slide it in, and then you'll be subscribed to our cloud service, and you can play whatever game you want on your phone. I think that's a lot more reasonable than Google. I think it's a lot more reasonable than NVIDIA. We have to get to the kids where they're playing the games and the kids are playing the games in Walmart. So tell your friends, be wary. If you have children, don't let them go to the game section because the Waltons are coming for your ass and they're coming hard. I will do my best to warn Atrioc. I will do my best to warn Mr. Microsoft about their Stadia. I will do my best to, to tell GameStop that, hey, this isn't gonna work even with all the publicity you've gotten from these stocks on Wall Street bets. And I will try and stop the Waltons from entering the space of cloud gaming. This could only happen through some hardcore investigative journalism. I want to make sure that you guys are on the lookout just like I am. So if you guys see any stories like this, if you are doing some research and you see something quirky, something cool, please post it in my Discord. If you need a link, it's discord.gg slash stands. I need more reporters. I need more people in the field. I need more people sending me content truly so that this show is easier to run because this morning I was fucking struggling. It took me an hour to find this goddamn Walmart thing. I was reading, I unironically, I, you think I'm joking? I was reading every single tweet about the Epic thing just to find a way to talk about it that wasn't goddamn Resident Sleeper. <laughs> and finding Walmart was the only thing that did it. I need you to do that for me because you're my special little boy, chat and or YouTube audience and or Spotify listener now. You're special. Just you, you specifically, you the one person. Thank you. On to story number two, cash for shorts. So recently we have talked a lot about, and whether this is on my stream or the stand show, it all holds true. The value of short form content in the esports and gaming world. Now, Cutie Cinderella launched a clips channel and she has gone straight to the moon. In fact, she is making the exact same amount on her 20,000 subscriber clips channel, or she was when I talked to her, as she is on her 150,000 subscriber YouTube channel that makes long form content that she has to pay her editors for that is really hard to do versus just yoinking a clip that the community probably clicked for her. Hey, fuck it. And then making a good thumbnail, putting a good title, some metadata, clickbaiting Ludwig, you know, the like. And she's passed it on to Ludwig. She's passed it on to HREC and she's passed it on to me. Anyone who watches me knows that we have a clips channel now. And this is a growing trend in the content space. And YouTube is trying to not only push clips, but push their new system shorts. Now shorts is not exactly what clips is. They're meant to be viewed on a phone. They're meant to be vertical video. They're not meant to be horizontal video. You're not supposed to click them after you're watching a long documentary on YouTube. You're supposed to click them when you're just vibing on your phone. You know, you're in between classes at high school or probably junior high based on the people who watch YouTube shorts and TikTok or college and say, Hey, what's going on in the shorts world? YouTube has says we are so excited about shorts and our ability to combat TikTok that we are releasing starting we are introducing a 100 million dollar fund where we are going to distribute different amounts of money to creators who make shorts to try and ignite the spark of shorts on the platform and i thought you know what this is pretty cool maybe i'll make a short but then i looked into it a little more and i realized that youtube are a bunch of broke bitches a hundred million dollars at first blush, I thought that's pretty good. A hundred million dollars for shorts creators? Are you kidding me? And I looked at who else is creating these funds to fund creators. And I realized that the Chinese government is making Susan look like a basic ass bitch. A hundred million dollars for YouTube shorts? She announced 200 million dollars for TikTok creators before this. Are you shitting me? You're gonna announce second and do less money, YouTube? What an embarrassment. An embarrassment for the US of A. We are trying to fight back against bite dance. We are trying to fight back against the Chinese government. And this is all you can do for us. 
Not only is China announcing 200 million for their TikTok fund, but they have said they're going to grow the fund to one billion dollars. I'm talking billion with a B by 2023. So YouTube, I want you to get your shit together. Fwiz, I'm looking at you. I don't care if it's gaming. I don't care if it's Logan Paul boxing Floyd Mayweather. We got to get more money into shorts. We have got to fight the TikTok menace because I'm going all in. I made a move with you. I stopped posting on TikTok a little bit and I'm posting mostly on my YouTube Clips channel. I'm doing this for you, Fwiz. I'm doing this for you, Susan. Please put me in the algorithm. But you can't leave me out here naked and afraid announcing a $100 million fund when TikTok's already doubled it. Come on, man. I'm doing this for you. This is your one opportunity to set things straight. I'm talking $2 billion to YouTube short form creators, both shorts and clips by 2024. Hey, give us an extra year and we'll do it because short form content is growing. We announce it right here on the stand show. Just you and me, buddy, buddy, Fwiz. You can sit, you can even sit on this side. There's more camera room and we'll just do it. And then you can buy me some shoes and then we can both go to the cash app compound. And then maybe Nate shot will make me co-owner of hundred thieves. I think he's a golfer now. I think everyone who used to be into sneaker culture in the esports space and has gotten a little older is now into golf and cryptocurrency. And unfortunately, I am into neither, which maybe tethers me to use Zoomers more, but it is not helping when I try and get YouTube to announce a $2 billion fund. I think I need to golf a little bit more. Anyways, I digress. Let's get on to story number three, esports shit that won't work esports shit that will not work esports shit that has no chance of working esports shit that i have seen time and time again over the years people who are repeating the same mistakes because they are not listening to history and this is a mistake that is easy to make because every single week twice a week when i put out these episodes one of you in the comments asks why isn't there an esports olympics why isn't there a company that is out there pulling together the best and the brightest of each country to compete in esports games for the pride of their countrymen? And every time I have to say that this has existed, the world cyber games were a thing. I have to talk about the challenges of working with a publisher. I have to talk about everyone who came before. I have to talk about the reason why esports teams don't want to lend their players to their country when they're competing on the same schedule for something like uh, CSGO that is every week and there's a major. But it seems like every week people are looking at my YouTube comments and trying to announce the next big esports global league. I am talking about a new company called hosted by Techno Blood Esports, which is the worst name I've ever heard. The WSL Organizing Committee or WSLOC, where WSL stands for the World Esports League. Wow, I found it. And I saw this article on Tech Bomb, and I thought, maybe there's something here. It's written by a man called Ron Scorsese. And when I see the name Scorsese, I think big business. I think someone who's got his finger on the pulse of the community. This is a company that was founded in Seoul, South Korea, that is trying to get only the biggest esports in the world, like PUBG and Clash Royale, together to create the World Esports League. Now, a couple of things set me off here. Lowercase e, capital S, while something I love is not something you want when you're announcing a global esports league. And I thought, maybe this is a tech bomb mistake. Let me check out the WSL website. Let me go to it and see if maybe they are doing a good job, whereas tech bomb is misquoting them. And so I went to the WSL website and this is what I saw. WSL, World Esports League, capital S, the esports you making i thought this website was probably written in korean it wasn't localized let me just hit translate and figure it out oh no this is a localized website for the world esports league the esports you making world esports league the world esports league is an international esports competition where everyone can join in that's great 100 plus nations global network the world's best e dash sports okay now here is where i have my first complaint if you're going to use lowercase e, capital S, you can't go to the dash. You can't go to the hyphen. Pick one and stay with it. It will mean that you have the huevos and or the rancheros to at least stick to your convictions, to stick to your guns. If you were having an old Western style shootout, you would be ready to fire right when it chimes. When you go back and forth, it makes me think you're wishy-washy and it makes me think that these 100 plus nations probably haven't signed up to compete in your league. 
In case you're wondering, the World Esports League will comprise of three phases, national tournament, regional tournament, and global finals. The players placed first in each nation qualify for the regional tournaments, and the winners of the regional tournaments compete for places in the WSL global finals. That sounds pretty good to me. We compete in our own country, we go to nationals, we go to regionals, we go to global finals. They also have a match center called Playpot, which is a very weird name for a match center, but hey, everyone needs to be a TO nowadays. Get some ads on your platform. And then I tried to figure out, well, what what games do you have in the WSL? You know, if you're going to put on this big tournament, you must have some games. Official game titles in 2021. Coming soon. It took research from the article separately from their website to find that they only want to run tournaments for PUBG, Clash Royale, and some random ass fighting games in Korea that are not good fighting games. They are not, it's not like they're going to run Street Fighter. It's not like they're going to run Dragon Ball Fighters or Super Smash Brothers Melee or Ultimate. They are only going to run fucking Melty Blood or some anime fighter bullshit. And they're not even willing to commit and put it in their website. Now, I'm not talking about this just to shit talk them. I didn't want to do an esports shit that won't work just to make them feel bad about what they've done, to talk shit about the way that they have phrased esports on their website or the grammar that they have used. But I just want to show you guys that you are just as smart as all these companies. You guys are asking the exact right questions. We mentioned it last week in the Q&A, but you guys are asking me now exactly what traditional sports organizations were asking two or three years ago. You guys are asking why there isn't an Olympics of esports, and then we are seeing companies say, why isn't there, but we also have the money to burn on it. And I am here to tell you that those have existed. They are going, they went away, and they are not coming back, except at the behest of the publishers. Overwatch League, or Overwatch proper was able to run an Overwatch World Cup. It is very good. It happens in the offseason because they have an ironclad grip on their game. I know through firsthand sources that Riot Games is trying to create a World Cup for League of Legends, but they don't know when to run it. The problem for Riot Games is that they have regional leagues, they have MSI, and they have a World Championship. When do they do the World Championship where they piece people together based on their country? It's a challenge for them. They don't want to let a third party like WSL do it because as you can see from their website, WSL wasn't smart enough to even use the right esports. So you guys are smart. Riot Games has an ironclad grip on their thing. Everyone wants to do this. No one is doing it right. And here is my commitment to you. The WSL will not be the first company to do this correctly. The WSL will not be the Olympics of esports. The WSL will be defunct and this website will be gone within six months. Or my name is Nathan One Night Stands Stands. That was me. For the Spotify listeners, that's me taking a bow. <laughs> you, could, you couldn't hear it. Now that I'm committed to getting these out as an audio-only experience, I think I have to do... Okay, so uh, yeah, Spotify listeners, you can't tell, but chat is clapping. They're really excited about this. They're saying, holy shit, you're so brave. How could you say that? Holy shit, you're so smart and handsome. Oh my god, 100 gifted subs? 200 gifted subs? Someone just said they would match it? 500 gifted subs? Oh my god, Ludwig's in chat. He says, you're the best content creator I've ever seen. He says he's gonna let me use his stream key to broadcast the stand show? Man, Spotify listeners, you're in for a treat. You better check this out next week on Tuesday or Friday. Twitch.tv slash stands. You're gonna love it. And now into my favorite segment, the Q&A. This is where we get to have a personal relationship. And as I always say, if you want to ask me a question, just put it in the comments. If you're watching this episode, episode 17 right now, or you're listening on Spotify, just go to the episode on YouTube, scroll down to the comments, and leave a question for me. I read every single question, and every week I select my two favorites to answer live on the show. Let's get into question one. When signing a team for a shooting game such as Valorant, CSGO, Fortnite, did you prioritize young, unproven talent with a high skill ceiling, or did you prefer to sign veteran, proven players slash IGLs? What was your thought process when building a team? Now, at first I thought, I'm not going to answer this question because this would be too much inside baseball. I'm going to reveal too many details about both Gen G and myself. But I kept going back to it. I kept scrolling and thinking, how could I give 
a compelling answer. How could I teach you guys something about not only the way that I think, but the way that other GMs might be thinking in the esports space. And then I saw the games again. I saw Valorant, CSGO, and Fortnite. And I thought, man, this is such a great opportunity to talk about the three different strategies that we used at Gen G when building these teams. The one that came first was Fortnite. So Gen G was a new brand in the United States. Gen G was not involved in Fortnite, and the Fortnite space for top players was very competitive. You had Team Liquid still at the top at the time, 100 Thieves was getting into it and paying a lot of money, NRG was going big and starting to sign Europeans. And as I talked to more players, as I went to events like PAX and talked to Morgasi right after he won, some of these other guys who were placing decently at tournaments, I realized that no one gave a shit about Gen G. And that's totally fine. These 14 to 18 year old Fortnite grinders did not have a care in the world about a new Korean team moving to the US. They only wanted to play for FaZe and 100 Thieves. And I thought we can either double their paycheck. We can say, no, you may not know about us, but you will in the future because we are gonna pay double whatever 100 Thieves plays and try and run it that way. Or we could get a little custy with it. We could get a little creative. And we realized that one thing that wasn't happening a lot, and one thing that definitely wasn't happening a lot in Fortnite, was opportunities for competitive women and girl gamers, right? Fortnite is a game that had a massive women and female audience, right? All of a sudden, kids in junior high, high school, girls are playing Fortnite, but girls aren't represented in Fortnite. So we can get players at a reasonable price, we can do something that no one else is doing, and we can align that with a sponsorship strategy by moving into women's Fortnite. Now, we did that with a couple of great players like Tina, Maddie, Carly, Moki, uh, it was actually amazing. Tina won. She was the only woman to win a professional Fortnite event at Twitch Rivals, which is awesome. Moki is the only girl or identifying girl to qualify for a major Fortnite tournament in first place in an open qualifier. Some amazing things happen, all because we rethought our strategy. Then on to CSGO. CSGO is a game with a lot of history. CSGO is a game that has a very developed data and analytics ecosystem behind it. CSGO is a world where you can see how effective IGLs or in-game leaders are. So when I was looking into CSGO, I thought it was important to do two things. One, try and buoy up the North American scene by signing North American players. There was only, at the time, NRG and Team Liquid, and we had kicked the tires on NRG, which later became EG, and it was just a little too expensive and didn't make sense for us. And <laughs> team, it's a Team Liquid team that didn't want to sell. And so we said, can we pick apart this Cloud9 team that has a great IGL, an IGL that has proven he can stay at the top of North America in DAPS, or at least do his best to, and a major winner in Tim Automatic Taw. So we did, like you asked in your question, look at IGLs and teams that we thought would help us get there. It's also very important when you are new to a game to sign players that have a history. CSGO has a history. I, Nathan Stans, the GM, don't know the history. So it is valuable for me to sign Tim and Damien so that I can talk to them about CSGO, so that I can learn what has happened in CSGO, so I can learn what to do and what not to do, what other teams are doing, how much people are paying, how many boot camps is normal. And so we signed those players and we put together a team that I thought was very interesting for North America. We got Ben Ted out of China. We got Som out of Envy. We got uh, Kusta, who was a player on Cloud9 with these two that is an up-and-coming player, now switched to Valorant and doing very well. And we competed at a high level before COVID hit. We won DreamHack Anaheim. We didn't lose a single game. We were ready for Flashpoint. We won the major qualifier number two at Summit. We beat Team Liquid, which is a team that everyone said was the best team in North America after the fall-off of EG. Unfortunately, we just weren't able to get our shit together in an online world, and it didn't work. JNG ended up dropping the team, but that was a secondary approach. We didn't try and do something different in CSGO. We tried to learn from those that had walked there before. And finally, the last team that I built, Valorant. Now, Valorant is a new game. Theoretically, you could follow your CSGO model and try and get someone who came from a tactical shooter and learn about it. But our supposition, what we posited was this. Native Valorant players are going to be the future of Valorant. And Tier 2 CSGO players were not getting the opportunities that they deserved because they were being gatekept by Tier 1 CSGO players and the lack of teams that would 
pay bubble prices in North America for a Tier 2 team. So we looked at players that had been around the Tier 2 scene in CSGO, like GMD and the team he played with in French Canada, and we looked at a lot of native talents. So we originally signed the Tier 2 CSGO team, French Canadians. They did very well competing with TSM in the early season, even beating them in events when TSM was the best team in the league. Sentinels came up. We beat them in a few tournaments. They started overtaking us. And then is where the second half of our idea came in. How can we find the native value Valorant players who are grinding this game every day that are going to be the faces of the game. We found players like Sean out there. Genji, as I'm hearing now, actually, I'm only hearing this from Reddit, so I can say it. I've heard that Genji is trying out through Reddit a player like Nature, who is an 18 year old IGL, which is something that would be so valuable. And when you mix those players who didn't get the chance with players who are coming up in a brand new game, I think you have a perfect storm to create something that is both a value for the team and has the upside of a championship winning North American roster. I would be very excited, for example, if Genji had both. Sean and Nature and GMD. I think that that team is nasty. And Kusta, a tier one North American Valorant player that had been playing his best CSGO, sorry, tier one North American CSGO player that had been playing his best CSGO right at the end of the scene. So I hope that they do it. Those are the three different strategies, the three different approaches we used as I was GM at Gen G. Hopefully that is an answer for you. The answer is basically there is no proven one. No team says we're only going to sign veterans. No team says we're only going to sign young guns. No team says we're only going to do things in a wild way. But you have to use a mixture of strategies to make sure that you are spending the right amount of money, making the right amount of money, and getting a level of competitive success that is appropriate for the spend and the expectation, which is a GM's job. Very interesting. On to question number two and our last question of the day. How do you think the digital merge of accessibility between T-Sports and eSports will affect their relationships with each other? Seeing as a lot of T-Sports are now using Twitch, the biggest platform for eSports, do you think this will benefit both or adopt more viewers into the eSports ecosystem? Now, what I think is less important than what the big wigs at these T-Sport leagues think. Now, Adam Silver, who is the commissioner of the NBA, has said that the Twitch viewer experience is significantly better than the viewer experience of a traditional NBA game. There is no reason that an NBA game shouldn't have a live chat where you can interact with other people. There is also no reason, and I think Adam Silver is trying to put his dick on the table here, he's trying to push policy, that you shouldn't be able to live bet on an NBA game while watching digitally, completely cutting out some of these traditional media middlemen. And I think that that kind of forward thinking, the kind of learning from esports and tech companies, it is what are going to prop up t-sports teams that need to grow in a future where they are competing with video games that kids love. It is hard for Major League Baseball to compete with Fortnite. Honestly, it's crazy that I see Major League Baseball players talking about Warzone all the time. It feels like every day I see a clip from ESPN saying like, check out what Mike Trout said at first base. Hey, you, you catch the new Warzone update? Let's play tonight, man. Because baseball is boring as shit. No one cares about baseball. And the commissioner of baseball needs to do something to make baseball more interesting. The NBA understands that. It's already the fastest growing league in the world. Traditional sports league in the world. Maybe actually North America. Let's say North America just so I don't fuck anything up. The fastest growing traditional sports league in North America. And with a commissioner that understands what esports is doing well, I think we are going to see more similar worlds. It is not going to look that different between watching the LCS and watching the NBA in five or ten years. We are going to see see a lot of things tested on Twitch that make their way to traditional esports leagues and I think that is going to bridge the gap between both esports and t-sports and t-sports and esports if I am watching the NBA on Twitch maybe I will click to Call of Duty because hey I played Call of Duty in college I may only watch the NFL and NBA now but Call of Duty is cool oh I'm seeing this guy Nade Shot who's running a hundred thousand dollar Warzone tournament that's badass I love playing Warzone with my bros oh shit Nade Shot owns an esports team so these guys compete in video games that's badass what else does hundred thieves do all of a sudden he's watching Nade Shot every day he's cheering for hundred thieves in Call of Duty he's seeing other games that hundred thieves is committed to he's watching other hundred thieves creators and we have created a funnel or a bridge between t-sports and esports and i think that moves both directions all of a sudden i see mango talking about the lakers every goddamn day if mango could host the lakers after his stream end and i could cheer for the lakers with a bunch of mango fans 
all of a sudden it's exciting for me to do esports. And if the viewer experience was similar to Twitch, where I am spamming emotes and making channel point bets, I think that that is very cool and very interesting. So I think Question Asker, who Question Asker had a profile picture with like a suit and tie. I think Question Asker is like a sports business person and is very smart. I think this question is amazing. Hopefully I answered it in a way that is interesting and makes you think. But I do think we are going to see a tighter bond between the smartest T Sports leagues and the smartest esports leagues. And hopefully that will propel both to greater heights and we will have more cultural touch points between the boomers like me and slightly older and the zoomers like you and slightly younger. Thank you so much for listening to The Stan Show, episode 17. Make sure you subscribe, whether it's on YouTube, Twitch, or Spotify. If you're watching on Twitch, follow the stream. I will have a new episode live recorded this Friday at 1 p.m. PST. This episode will be live for the Twitch audience on YouTube tomorrow. If you're watching it on YouTube, click the bell, leave a comment. Uh, the comment can just be a cool comment. Some people said, hey, Stans, you're very handsome. And that's a good comment, too, because Susan likes that in the algorithm. You don't have to ask a question. You could just leave a comment that says how smart, how handsome I am, how I'm on the cutting edge of content, how Adam Silver should bequeath the role of NBA commissioner to me so that I can run the NBA. Uh, Devin Booker said that actually I am who Kendall Jenner deserves because I'm just a better person, maybe even a better basketball player. It's just a lot of things are going on in the comment sections. You're going to have to check it out if you don't believe it. I love you guys. See you next episode.